Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, thanks again for showing up this morning. I trust all of you had a good weekend. Um, as you can see, our first presenter is Honorable Kenson Kazimi, MP for Grozile, and Minister for Youth Development and Sports. He will address us right now. Thank you very much, Melissa. Of course, I think we are all getting the jitters and the excitement of the 2024 version of the Olympics. Uh, we've announced our three participants from St. Lucia. Um, of course, Julian Alfred, Luke Chevry, and Michael Joseph. Um, really expecting big things from all three of our participants at this year's Olympics. And so we get set and ready to go sports metaphors. Um, I think we, uh, we've done all in our power to ensure that we can address as many of the issues that we would have had in terms of their preparation, the Olympic Committee, the Athletics Association, and of course the sailing fraternity are all get up and ready to go. So I think as sports minister, we are making the trip over to provide all the support we can tangibly um, next week. And we certainly hoping for historic results. Questions? Jan Odom Smith, swimming. Oh my God, my boy. Jan Odom Smith, of course, in the swimming fraternity. Talk about tangible support. Can mm -hmm. you give us some more insight into how the government is collaborating? Well, first and foremost, the government is uh, collaborating with HDS to actually bring as much as possible the information, the athletics village, the, the background, the foreground of everything that will happen in Paris to the people of St. Lucia. Um, but even before that, the collaboration with the athletes, the Olympic Committee in terms of financing most of the preparation, in terms of uh, getting them all that they would need mentally to be part of a global event, I think the Ministry and the Olympic Committee and the associations have done a really, really good job. I remember in my time as an athlete, the amount of support I would have gotten, I guess the science would have not been as advanced as it is right now in terms of ensuring that, you know, the actual videography, the mental work to accompany the physical work that the athlete is doing. I think all fraternities in St. Lucia and the sporting landscape can really boast of having a modern approach to the preparation for the athletes. Um, in St. Lucia, are we going to see a situation where there are viewing areas to watch the games for the public? Can you give more information on that? Absolutely. We are planning on having a north, south, east and west approach to ensuring that uh, St. Lucians can gather to actually view our athletes when they are participating in their respective events. We are looking at uh, View Fort, Souffre, we're looking at Up North and Castries. Um, big screens, the vibe, the overall experience, including a uh, celebration that we are anticipating and we won't let the cat out of the bag yet um, for our athletes when they get to that podium finish. Um, so we will be providing more information through an advertisement that we expect to be placed on television and social media in terms of the actual time that our athletes will be in competition with the hopes of getting as many people in one particular place to really enjoy uh, this year's Olympic Games and be part of the festivities and the celebration of St. Lucia's performance. Yeah, Mr. Minister, the, um, as a minister of youth development and sports. We know sports is, you know, gender, it, it, it transmits gender and age. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the youth factor, you think the schools are, are, are fully aware? Like, I mean, we know Julian just leaving school, you know, um, Jaden, are the youths, do you, are you conscious that the youths are fully aware of, of, of this, of the magnitude of this event and the schools are priming? And, up cheerleaders or that, you know, that kind of Thank you very much for that question because sports development is really a unified effort and it would really be crazy if by now we've not seen the need for all of us to get involved, um, including teachers. We had a recent election for PE Teachers Association, uh, physical education teachers, and um, I, I would be very, very surprised if our schools do get in on what we have to do in terms of our next generation of athletes or just students being aware of the gravity 
of what's actually going on right now in St. Lucia as it pertains to sports development and the prospect of a global medal at an Olympic game um, a couple of weeks away. And so, I mean, just, just I, I'm, I'm appreciative of the question so that I can actually reach out to teachers, parents, uh, community activists, all and sundry to really, uh, this is a time to come together and really celebrate athleticism. I mean, we have it every four years, and this is the first time as a as a country we've had some of somewhat of a hype with Laverne and Spencer, but in terms of the actual expectation, I don't think we've ever created a buzz as we've created so far. And I think the buzz has to the credit has to go to Julian for her performances, but the Athletics Association, I mean, even the sports fraternity in terms of the sports news agency, they've really done a very good job in terms of letting St. Lucia know who these athletes are, what they've, they've accomplished and what they are trying to accomplish. So this is a carry on call for teachers to really speak to the students for five minutes about what's about to happen so they can be part of the actual history that is about to be created in St. Lucia. Just find it. And you know, we know there's a wider marketing, you know, um, marketing aspect with our familiar t-shirts and would the ministry kind of support you know this I know is you know the marketing gurus but would you support that kind of marketing initiative your flags and t-shirts and you know the whole our familiar I appreciate that question because again we really need to get to a point where as a society we don't necessarily de depend on government I think a small business owner uh, entrepreneur this is an opportunity for them to actually make money. There is a buzz about Julian Alfred. And so I don't think it's the ministry's position to buy shirts, to sell to the public that reflects what's happening. I think small entrepreneurs, we have a youth economy, we have a number of, 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 of we have access to financing for an individual to see the need to actually sell paraphernalia so he can actually make money, employ other persons, and of course allow that to circulate in the economy. So there's an opportunity. We still have two weeks to go. Um, I have taken, I've had the discussion, I've heard people say, oh, why doesn't the ministry um, sell paraphernalia and that sort of stuff? I really don't want to get involved as a minister in private enterprise. I think it actually, um, it thwarts some of the efforts that could be made by small businesses in St. Lucia. And I certainly hope that small individuals take the opportunity to really be part of this historic event. I have three questions for you, Minister. Mm -hmm. um, just to continue along the spirit that you are at. Uh, Julian Alfred, by, by no small feat, is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But we know that uh, you know her success did not occur in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly that she seemed to have found her stride once leaving our shores. Literally. Uh, yes, <laughs> leaving, leaving our shores. And so I'm asking, are we at a point where we are studying maybe the Jamaica model and how they are building their athletes? Um, and how does the National Sports Academy fit into all of this? And does it, can it even play a role, in, to your mind, on how we begin to build our athletes? There's a number of things to unpack here. First and foremost, as a Minister of Youth Development and Sport, and as a former athlete, I would have been one of those who envied the Jamaican model as a young athlete at Crosley Primary and then at Leonis Comprehensive and then obviously at university. And uh, that was one of the premises on which I built having the island champs because really and truly, if you look at what Jamaica is doing, mm -hmm. they are building very strong alumni associations with all their schools. And so they've commercialized the school sports program. And so you have a number of athletes, former athletes, and of course, business-minded individuals investing in the school sports program. And from that investment, you have proper equipment, you have proper programs and coaching and supplementation and all those things being done at an earlier time. And so this has been the thrust towards having an island champs that really exposes our athletes on a Sunday afternoon to all of St. Lucia. And we saw last year record numbers of businesses being involved in our school athletics program. Uh, parents being involved at the event and so it's pretty much the first year we had it and this year of course I have instructed the permanent secretary and of course the director to really get involved in 
setting up alumni associations at every secondary school, especially those with a rich culture, the St. Mary's College, St. Joseph's Convent, Leon Hess, Entry Post, Viewford Comprehensive, and see how in each community we can gather as much support for the school's program to really strengthen it so we can see more Julian Alfreds coming out. Of course, we see Viewfort winning back-to-back -back championships and we know historically Viewfort has done very well. There is a commercial sector that is investing. There is a community that is investing. And so it's incumbent upon the schools, the ministry, and all and sundry in the communities to really see who those athletes are and provide additional support for those athletes. And I think when we actually perfect this, we'll see way more Julian Alfreds and Michael Josephs and Jaren Alden Smith and Luke Shavriers actually propping up and becoming our representatives at Olympics. I think and was... today I was asking you about the National uh, yes, Sports yes. Academy. The National Sports Academy. Currently, the National Sports Academy does not fall under the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports. It falls under the Ministry of Education. The thrust of the National Sports Academy is pretty much using sport as a means of bringing young people into an education program. Um, the ambition of the Sports Academy is more education if you speak to the permanent secretary, if you speak to officials from the Ministry of Education. I have gone on record as saying as a Minister of Sport that I would have had a different structure for the Sports Academy. I think um, the space in Beau really lends itself to having high performance centers for the different sporting activities rather than just a sports academy um, that brings in about 30 in enrollment in a program and uh, which costs a particular amount to, to the government. I would have preferred to have a high performance um, center including track and field, including football, cricket, where we can have specific coaching even on the weekends for our athletes that really propels them towards what they want to do. So I would have done the reverse and I've made my position very clear to the cabinet of ministers that I believe it would be more productive, we would get a lot more achieved if we use a high performance module rather than having it as an academic institution. But that's something you can pursue, can you not? Oh, I've pursued it from day one. And I think if you speak to the Minister of Education, the Prime Minister would say that I presented a full blown proposal for what a sports uh, high performance center would reflect, given the locales, given the, the Darren Sammy Cricket Grounds is right there, given the Grosley playing field, the proximity, and how it is that we can actually commercialize some activities by inviting other islands to actually use a facility that is equipped with the proper sports medicine facilities for recovery, for injury management, the, the proper sports psychology facilities at that very same venue for mental preparation of our fleets ahead of competition, the proper recovery of our athletes in terms of ice bath, in terms of massages, in terms of, and that is the model that, that I believe St. Lucia should gravitate towards. Um, and obviously, we'd have different points of views um, within cabinet ministers as to whether or not we, you, you know, we discredit the sports academy and move into high performance, or whether we keep the current structure that has produced some results and move on in that direction. I think that is a discussion that we'll continue to have. Um, like I said, a full proposal is on the table in terms of the cost analysis for having high performance as opposed to a sports academy um, that has been presented to the cabinet as well. But can the two coexist? Can we have a sort of uh, independent functioning uh, high sports uh, um, uh, performance facility um, where you would bring in you know, not That's, just the students from the sports academy, but you identified elite athletes. That is not, I don't think for a smaller economy that given the fact that we have secondary schools with PE teachers, with a proper physical education system that has produced a Julian Alfred, a Naomi London, the likes of Michael Joseph, I don't, I think it is redundant. I believe that most of the students could be filtered into proper physical education programs in school. I spoke earlier about the model of actually getting outsiders from the communities, alumni association, coaches, and all of that to be part of the school program in each secondary school. Once you have this functioning, the athletes, the athletes at the base of a sports development program, which is 
the widest base, they will be in a physical education program that is similar to what happens at the sports academy. When they get to the development after secondary school, they can then filter into the high performance program where we have the best coaches from the region available to us to provide that level of mentorship and physical and mental training to propel them to the next level until they get probably a scholarship to school or they get an opportunity to go overseas. So my position is strengthen the physical education um, program in every secondary school. Strengthen the Nolan associations, get sponsorship, get corporate sector involvement in every secondary school's program, absorb these individuals from the sports academy in those programs, set up a high performance center for those who actually flourish after secondary school to give them the best opportunity to be the best version of themselves in sports development. My second question has to do with facilities, mm -hmm. and I'm going to speak specifically to the SAB, mm -hmm. Fiji Sports, um, the field there. Um, and just on our way here, we were mm -hmm. just seeing, you know, the dismantling of the stage and removal of the of the, uh, the, the bleachers that were brought in, and uh, and this is like a week plus after Carnival, and. Would you believe it, Minister? There was a very a small area where a group of, of, of youngsters were, you know, because apparently they're having a little camp, a little summer camp, and they, you know, as we would say in our little Creole, they're in a coin while all of this activity is happening. Why did it take so long, Minister, for the, the field to be cleared up after Carnival? That's the question. I'm happy that you're asking the Minister of Sport that question and not the actual Minister of Creative Industries because I think St. Lucia have heard ad nauseum my position that in the first place that we must identify a national entertainment centre for our creatives in this country. I do have a proposal um, in terms of where in terms of the structure and how it's going to work over the next couple of years, in terms of having a place to host those carnival events, those entertainment events, that does not allow our young sportsmen and women to have to wait this inordinate amount of time for the use of the field. The use of the field is first and foremost for the development of the community, those individuals, young, not so young, physical fitness, that is the purpose of those fields. And I have said, and I'll continue to say, that I would prefer that we do not have those activities at those grounds. And so today, um, I am going to definitely have this conversation. We have spoken a lot about the financing um, for this entertainment center. I do have a plan for how it's going to be financed and pay, actually pay back, get the returns, and therefore, in the future, um, allow this place to be used as opposed to the VG playing field. It hurts my heart as a sports minister. And I've said this and I'm going to continue to say it. There is no sports minister that I've met who is happy that entertainment and that sort of stuff is going on in the Caribbean simply because we don't have a history of discipline. People say it can work. All they have to do is cover it and make sure. But we do not and we've not shown the discipline in terms of the entertainers, in terms of those who are the event persons, to get out of our facilities in a timely manner. And so I'm going to continue to lobby to ensure that this does not continue to happen. And I believe, I believe I'll be vindicated very soon. And are you at liberty to share with us what that proposal is in terms of the venue that you have in mind? I am. I am. I, I, feel, I feel confident that it is something that we can do in the short term. There is an area in the Beau that is Crown Land where we would have earmarked a, a previous sort of proposal. It has not been used. Um, the area is spacious enough. Um, it is, we would have to go through a process of, of engaging the community and you know, ensuring that we have uh, all the soundproof mechanisms into, in place to ensure that it doesn't really impact people as much as it could. Um, the proposal is to commence it as early as possible, similar to what we had at um, this area next to St. James Club. I think it was called Salmon's, Salmon's Park, Park, where Salmon's Park uh, commenced as pretty much a barrier wall around and a stage. I believe we can start that way. Um, 
the monies from the rental uh, could be used to further um, cover up the place and make it more appealing to individuals. Uh, it, for me, it's a simple matter of clearing, uh, having the perimeter wall, having a proper stage, and taking it from there on and removing activities from the places like the sad playing facility. Does does your office, your your ministry, mm. um, uh, have any? How should I put it? Do do you do you have any sort of vetting rights, if you will, mm -hmm. on the sort of media contingent mm -hmm. um, from Saint Lucia for uh, for for Paris? Uh, and I'm asking that because a very credible individual posted. Uh, this morning that someone who has never been involved in sports at all mm -hmm. will be quote-unquote representing the media of St. Lucia in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Minister, and again, you are very near and dear to sports. Absolutely. Uh, so what, what's your take on that in terms of, you know, people who are going to be accredited uh, to disseminate information to the public? Back right. home. So first and foremost, uh, the Ministry of Youth Development and Sport, we, no, we do not have the vetting power in terms of who decides or who goes on to provide coverage to a private entity. Um, every single media organization here, they are in a position to write to the international uh, body for the Olympics, the IOC, International Olympic Committee, to request accreditation. And every media entity, as a private media entity, could go through a process similar to the World Cup, similar to any global event, of identifying somebody from that media corporation as somebody who has the capacity to provide information on uh, what's actually going on at the Olympics. And every single media body here would have been able to make that application. The final decision would not have been made by the Ministry of Sports, but by the International Olympic Committee as to whether or not that media corporation is credible, whether that individual is an actual media practitioner, and whether or not that person can provide information to an audience uh, as to what's actually going on at the Olympics. So it's a process where, I mean, HGS, DBS, uh, Choice, once they have the financing to provide that sort of accommodation uh, and assistance to an individual that they have chosen. Again, DBS could have chosen a particular person, um, and I would not have had any power to say to DBS, no, this is not an individual that I want to, uh, to go to um, the Olympics to provide you with information, but I would have totally been out of place. And so it was really up to the media organizations to, to actually apply for accreditation and, of course, receive it from the International Council. But DBS is not querying, by the way, just for the record. Oh, I was just using an example. Just, oh, okay. Just, just, <laughs> DBS just was, for inquiring minds. Well, DBS was the last place I did sports. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, it comes to mind quicker. So, yeah, so in terms of sports broadcasting. But, yeah, um, really and truly, uh, if you have, let's just say, for instance, so Winston Springer Jr. at HGS, who has previous inf um, knowledge on sports, a uh, previous sportscaster, and uh, HGS decides that this is the individual they would send up for accreditation. Um, the process for accreditation and, and, and uh, pretty much given that level of accreditation would be from the outside agency, and of course HGS would have to foot the bill to get him over there to provide that information. So you say, that, so you say this individual is officially an official representative? Who is, who is the individual we're speaking about? Do, do you, does the media want to just ask me directly so I can... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm giving... Oh, oh, okay. All right. Well, yes, that would not be, that would not be from, from the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports. We would not be the one opining on, on his attendance at um, the Olympics. But would, the, would the SLOC have any say in this? Yeah. No? Would the SLOC? I don't even think, to be very honest, I don't want to be presumptive, but... We have to understand that this is private enterprise. This is not a government-run agency. This is not GIS. If it was GIS sending an individual, then I, as a sports minister, would definitely get involved and get in, have that level of engagement as to who I believe would be best suited 
to provide that level of experience on what's happening because I think it's an experience. The Olympics is an experience on and off the field and track. And so um, had it been from that angle, then I would have had a lot more to say. But given that a private organization run by a private entity has chosen a private individual, it would be, uh, individual, it'd be remiss of me to then come here and say that the individual should not have gone or that individual should have gone or they would not provide any value to what the Olympics is to an audience. So is state media accompanying our delegation, our official delegation? Um, currently, no. We do not have a contingent from the state. We believe that uh, St. Lucia is advanced in technology um, enough for them to be able to use their phones, uh, get internet access or cable television to actually view the games and for them to have an appreciation for what actually happens. I think a private media corporation may see value in more of the off the field activities, providing that level of entertainment of, you know, the warmth of being in an athletics village because it's an experience like no other. You literally, I mean, the first time I saw, I mean, saw Usain Bolt just walk right in front of me in an athletics village, I mean, I was, I was awestruck. So bringing that to an audience is something that, I mean, I would want to encourage for people to, to actually see and have. But the actual activity around the track itself. I think we we have more than enough competence in ESPN and all those other places for us to get that sort of perspective. One more thing, I thought I would have been asked that today, but I just really want to go on record. I was, um, I was informed that a, a video was circulating that additional works were happening at the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds. Um, I need to make it abundantly clear that for the next four years of me being a minister, and that's beyond the next election, the Minister of Sport, they will always, always have work happening in and around the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds as we, as we seek to provide better and better playing facilities for our, our people. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our final speaker for this morning, Honorable Moses Jabatis, Minister for Health, Wellness and Elderly Affairs. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the press. I'm very pleased to be here this morning to share a few thoughts with you and, of course, to answer any questions uh, which you may have. We are approaching the, the third anniversary of our government on Friday the 26th of July 2024 will mark three years of the Philip J. Pierre St. Lucia Labour Party administration. During our campaign, we promised the people of St. Lucia that the St. Jude Hospital Rehabilitation Project would take center stage and of course throughout the three years, we caused certain processes to take place, which at this time has resulted in the continued rehabilitation of the St. Jude Hospital at Oje. You would know, based on many pronouncements of the prime, by the Prime Minister, that this project is advancing at what we consider to be a rapid pace, and we hope in the next few weeks the pace of the reconstruction and rehabilitation of the St. Jude Hospital will move even faster. We also saw during these three years the conversion of the respiratory hospital, which we knew as Victoria Hospital, into a secondary care hospital of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex, the Cuban Eye Care Clinic, and we are preparing to continue rehabilitation works so that we can move the Castries Wellness Center and an urgent care center into the Castries Urban Polyclinic. We also um, successfully launched our universal health coverage program, and we did indicate to the population that we were doing the universal health coverage program in a phased way. We launched the, the maternal and child care program where thousands of pregnant ladies receive uh, maternal well, care at no cost, blood tests and ultrasounds, and we are very pleased that this program has gone well. We continue to do training in palliative care and also training of nurses at all wellness centers where the services have been provided. We continue to strengthen our 80 plus program, our 80 golden plus program, which 
which causes benefits and services to be received by St. Lucians who are 80 years or older. We know that this program had a number of challenges in the implementation of it, and this year we are strengthening this program to ensure that pharmaceuticals in particular are available to the individuals who benefit from this program. There has been an increase in activities in the St. Lucia Moves program. As we've said before, our major challenge in St. Lucia is the burden with non-communicable diseases. We are seeing an increase um, in the rate at which our St. Lucians are, are falling ill because of non-communicable diseases. And the St. Lucia Moves program continues to have different phases, several additional phases. One of our main challenges is with the accident and emergency departments at both the St. Jude Hospital and the Millennium Heights Medical Complex, Owen King EU Hospital. We have had a number of challenges with St. Lucians and other individuals who access services at the hospitals having to wait for services and we have had meetings with both the administrations of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex and the St. Jude Hospital to ameliorate the situation. I'm very pleased to report that just last week we held a very special meeting in cabinet with the medical director of the Owen King EU Hospital, the Millennium Heights Medical Complex, with the chair of the board of the Millennium Heights Medical Complex, also with the chair of the board of the St. Jude Hospital and the, the chief executive officers of both the St. Jude Hospital and the Millennium Heights Medical Complex to see how best the government can advance plans to cause there to be better services and faster services, more efficient services at the accident and emergency departments. A number of decisions were taken, including the provision of more bed space, more beds by the Millennium Heights Medical Complex at the old Victoria Hospital and also at the, the, the Mental Wellness Center to improve services there. Very soon, in a matter of days, we are going to launch the cervical and prostate cancer screening program, which will form part of the universal healthcare program, where ladies will receive um, additional services in cervical cancer treatment, and also the prostate cancer um, diagnosis, will be launched, additional prostate cancer diagnosis will be launched, and all of these services will be without cost to those St. Lucians who will access the services. In a few days, you will hear a lot more about that. The Grosile Polyclinic, we are working to cause this polyclinic to remain a 24-hour facility. We have had the Grosile Polyclinic with, with, with the addition of, of staff and other resources remain open for 24 hours when there are um, national events. And so we are working very hard to ensure that this remains the norm, that we have the Grosile Polyclinic and a few other medical facilities around St. Lucia to remain open for 24 hours. We believe this will significantly reduce the pressures on both the Millennium Heights Medical Complex, the Owen King E Hospital Accident and Emergency Department, and also the St. Jude Hospital Accident and Emergency Department. Sadly, tomorrow, the, the family of, of, of the family and also the medical fraternity will lay to rest our very dear Dr. Didier. And it is really sad for, for all of us um, to have lost Dr. Didier. Of course, the government would have sent condolence, official condolences to the family. And you would know by now that the government has decided to rename the Gozile Polyclinic um, after Dr. Didier. Um, much more about this will, will be discussed a little later. But again, I want to send condolences to the condolences, sorry, to the family, to the wife and family of Dr. Didier, and also to the to the medical fraternity in St. Lucia. I now ask whether you have any questions? Yes, please, please, just, just um, in terms of the the the, um, the senior program, the, the the over eighty, 
there have been some concerns, some queries as to you know the efficiency of the rollout of this program. Can you just briefly, you know, tell us, you know, what is what is the format? What what what, what does it require for someone over eighty to benefit from these services? What would be the, the requirements? What was the procedure like? Well, yes, the the program was rolled out, and the requirements are that the individual needs to simply present the identification card. We know that we had some challenges, especially in the area of of, of, of pharmaceuticals, because at the same time, we had some, some issues with the supply chain and also the, the procurement agency, the OECS procurement agency. Um, there were some issues with obtaining some of the pharmaceuticals. We also recognized that our, our, our stock of pharmaceuticals came under some pressure because at the same time, we launched what is called a performance-based financing program, which allowed um, an additional four to 5,000 St. Lucians um, to receive medication um, without, without pain at our wellness centers. We have since evaluated the, the, the shortfalls of, of the implementation of this program, and certainly we are hoping that in the next few months, the 80 plus program will be better serviced and that the individuals who approach the wellness centers will have much better service. The services are at the wellness centers. We know that initially we did announce that all of these services are to be expanded to the hospitals. We are working with both the St. Jude Hospital and the Owen King E Hospital to give us a package of services, to cost a package of services that are being accessed by pe people of, of, of that age so that we can, we can reasonably and realistically service them at the hospitals also. But the main concern we, were, we, 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 we received, the main concerns had to do with access. How do people access it? Some individuals were, were complaining that they were not um, able to access, that they had to go to the ministry to fill a form. That we have corrected. As long as you present your ID card and you're over 80, you should get the services. But we do admit we do admit that there were some some problems with the with the implementation at the beginning. So it does not apply to private doctors. No, at this time, no. It is the primary um, care facilities. What we are trying to do, and all of this is part of our strategy um, to implement universal health coverage. If we are to implement universal health coverage successfully, we must ensure that at our primary level, the health centers and the Grosile Polyclinic and the primary services capture the data properly so that even though individuals are seeing the private doctors in the case of the maternal and child care services, we still ask them to go to the health centers to register and to, to see the doctor. If there are services that need to be had in the private sector, like the, the ultrasounds and the blood tests and so on, we still pay. We still pay private sector um, companies to do it for us. If there are services that um, can be rendered by the private sector, we pay to the private sector. We have arrangements, we have um, contracts with private sector agencies um, in, in the medical field to do this. So we, we are going through the primary health healthcare, the primary centers to ensure that our, our people are registered so that we can provide a better universal health coverage service. Um, Minister, where are we right now? Um, as you said, the St. Jude Hospital Reconstruction Project, it's, at, it's rapidly advancing, right? Yes. So um, where are we right now? What, what work is being done? Um, what buildings are being, I guess, fixed? I know the Prime Minister in his New Year's address had said that by June 4, the buildings would have been completed, after which um, then a, a, a contractor would have been, I guess, selected for the bidding process to continue to do that final phase. So um, has a contractor been um, selected and when is that, well, the, the bigger work, when is it going to start and, and, and how much also of the monies that were borrowed will be used to complete the hospital? First of all, the Prime Minister did make public a few, um, I think it's about two weeks or so, to, and he indicated that the, the no objection, which was the final phase um, in terms of the, the procurement process, the no objection from the Saudis, um, that no objection was received. There are a few administrative matters that are taking place now, and when I say now, I mean actually happening now, 
and then the Prime Minister will make um, an announcement about the selection of the contractor. But the process included a, a no objection at the end of the process, and that has been received. The Prime Minister did say so publicly. So I expect very soon that an announcement will be made. In, in terms of what's happening now, well, the four buildings which we've been talking about, these buildings, I can tell you now that the works that are happening now are, are wiring works, plumbing works, and that, that kind of thing. So these buildings are, are almost completed. It's just the, the wiring and the plumbing that's happening. Very soon, as soon as the Prime Minister makes the announcement, um, you will see the major works to completion um, happening. But we are pretty confident with what we see on the ground um, in the buildings and around the, the construction site. We are pretty confident that when the major works begin, it will not be very long before the government can say, yes, we are moving to final commissioning of the hospital. How long do you estimate this will take, the final work? I don't want to, to estimate, but I'm sure that the Department of Economic Affairs, um, during the announcement of the, of the, after the no objection, I'm, I'm hopeful that that, will be, that information will be provided. Um, in February, you had announced that um, Sir Lucia was owing the Martinique officials, I, I think, about $2 million yes. in, in medical debt. Um, where are we in terms of paying back the money? Well, certainly we have had discussions with the, 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 France, um, the, the, the French ambassador on this matter, and our department, our accounting um, staff at the ministry continue to work with the hospital in Martinique to ensure that there is proper reconciliation. And they have been working to ensure that reconciliation is taking place so that we can, we can pay back. So we are committed to paying them back. And um, certainly, even the Matnik side, they, they have agreed that before anything like that happens, there must be proper reconciliation, and that is happening um, as we speak. So no money has been paid back yet? No, not yet. We are hoping that the reconciliation will be completed so that we can start repatriating some funds. Okay. Uh, St. Jude, Minister, we're hearing reports of mold infestation in the building and particularly um, the affecting surgical um, in the theater. Can you um, speak to that and what is the action your ministry is taking to, to remedy? If you're referring to St. Jude at the stadium, Yes. That's what you're referring well, to, yes. Certainly. That's what we know. We know now, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to be sure. <laughs> um, well, clearly, there have been some issues with, with the, the stadium and with the, the hospital being operated at the stadium. We recognize that, and I cannot speak specifically about the mold issue, but I can tell you we are aware of several issues that are actually um, being taken care of now as we speak. In the last budget, the Prime Minister did make an allocation of $1.3, $1.4 million so that the administration of the hospital can take care of issues that have come up even before we move to the rehabilitated St. Jude Hospital at the OG site. So yes, we are uh, aware that there are issues. There were issues with the, with, with, with the joints, the, 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 the joints which, which, well, the building is made up of several, several joints um, the sitting area of the stadium is made up of several joints, and during heavy showers, the water seeps through those joints to go down in some parts of the hospital, and those joints are being addressed now. We know that there are several safety issues in relation to some of the rings at the stadium, these Olympic rings that look like Olympic rings. Some of those, 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 those rings really needed to be to be changed because of safety concerns. And as we speak now, there is a contractor on ground and they are removing those rings. We know that there are issues with, with lighting, with safety. And the hospital administration did make you know, representation. They, they, did, they did it since last year. And the prime minister did make an allocation. And I know that the hospital administration is engaging elect qualified electricians to ensure that that lighting, the lighting situation improves. We also know that there's a situation at the stadium with, and, and the hospital with a lack of bed space. And I know that um, as we speak, there are contractors who are creating um, spaces and, and um, renovating spaces, rehabilitating spaces, so that the St. Jude Hospital can have at least eight or nine additional beds. 
So yes, there are issues. I admit that there are issues. But as we speak now, there are several contractors on ground who are organizing to remediate some of these problems. Because even though we are rehabilitating the, the site at, at OG, we want to ensure that we can make the stay at the stadium, um, the short time that they have left there, we want to make that stay as comfortable as possible for, for the patients, the staff, and the, the, you know, the, the medical professionals. So you've not received any reports of mold? I have not received specific reports about mold, but I will admit that we have received general reports about issues in a number of the of the wards and the rooms and so on. So there may be a specific problem, but I have not seen that report. But I can tell you that the administration of the St. Jude Hospital continues to, to liaise with the ministry in relation to, 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 in relation to these general problems. So I will not doubt that, but I must say that they have been reporting to us several issues and we have been doing our very best to act upon those reports. But I can, I can, I will certainly find out when I leave and if there is any specific information about that, I can get back to you on what exactly we're doing to, to take care of that. Um, just another question. But I was going to follow up with right. Zane's question. I realized that you left it out in your response. The breakdown in the financing of the, uh, the um, well, now the reconstruction project right. for St. Jude now. Right. Because uh, I believe she was asking about how much is going for yes, yes, and the cost mm -hmm. of that right. phase. Well, um, I've said before that in the questions in relation to the specific costs for the project, you will recall that the the loan um, has the loan must take care of the St. Jude reconstruction and also works at the national the George Odlum National Stadium. In relation to the specific costs and in relation to the allocation of these costs, the Department of Economic Affairs will provide um, the specific information in relation to the costs. We are dealing the, with, the, with the, the commissioning of the hospital, the, the medical staff, and, and those issues. But I can assure you that the Department of Economic Affairs will be able to give you that, that information, especially when they, they will deal with the the no objection and the, the works that are the, the rest of the works. So the government is seeking, uh, am I correct? Is the government seeking additional funding for St. Jude reconstruction in addition to the 200 plus, uh, just the over 200 million that you're getting from the Saudis? Is no, no, no. I was speaking off? specifically about the Saudi loan because the Saudi loan is for both the reconstruction of the hospital and the, and the repair to the yes, George Adams Stadium. That fact. But yes. I'm asking, is the, has the government sought additional funding for this project? Well, all I know is that we continue to, to engage agencies, especially for the, for the medical side of it. We continue to engage agencies like the Pan American Health Organization, the CDB, and other agencies to do the improvements in the medical equipment, although this Saudi loan takes care of medical equipment, but we continue, it's a continuous process where the Ministry of Health engages those agencies to improve every aspect of the hospital. So the Saudi loan, although it is to reconstruct the hospital and to purchase medical equ equipment, the Ministry of Health continuously engages other partners to improve whether it be service, service delivery, to improve um, certain processes at the hospital. So the 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 the, 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 of the, the the ministry's processes to seek funds for all of these other actions continue. Okay, so that would be a yes. Before I yield to, to my colleague Zane, I just have another question. Um, and she asked you earlier about the uh, monies owed to the, the, the French, to Martinique. And you, you indicated that you're doing a reconciliation. Right. Payments will, will be made at, as soon as that process is done. Where does the health and uh, the health Help me the name again, the levy? Health and security. Health and security levy. How much have we collected to date, and how much of what we have collected has gone to the ministry to help with the health woes that we are experiencing in the country? Well, certainly the Prime Minister in the last budget would have indicated the amount. I can't remember exactly. It must have been 30 million or so that was collected. But the, the budget of the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and Elderly Affairs. And all of the equipment, the, the, the purchases, the work that we're doing at the 
Millennium Heights Medical Complex, the work at the secondary hospital, the work that we, have, we, we are doing at the Grosile Polyclinic and all of the wellness centers. The Prime Minister did indicate very clearly that the health and security levy, both for health and security, will form part of the budget. And the budget estimates clearly indi indicate that a source of funds for financing the budget would be the health and security levy. And therefore, all of, these expen all of the expenditure that, that, that we have in, some of them with millions of dollars, even between the last budget and now, in terms of purchasing new medical equipment, in terms of ensuring that, that we, we, we purchase um, ambulances and so on, all of these, the health and security levy would contribute to it. I cannot tell you now specifically that the health and security levy contributed X amount to this particular ambulance or this program. What I can tell you is the amounts that we've spent even between the, between the last, but in the last financial year, the, the amounts that we spent, even this financial year, the amounts that we are spending, the health and security levy, um, it's not even coming close to what we are spending um, for health. Just the, the, the works at the, the St. Jude Hospital, the works at the, the stadium, even now, the works at the Millennium Heights Medical Complex to establish the secondary care hospital. And even now, we, are, we, we, we will be expending very soon about $500,000 to put some additional beds for the Millennium Heights Medical Complex. We are going to spend that also at the, at the Mental Wellness Center. We'll be spending possibly another $189,000 to improve personnel to improve personnel at the accident and emergency, um, at the accident and emergency department at the Owen King EU Hospital because of the, the especially the recent numbers we are seeing, 17,000 um, patients at accident and emergency at OKEU a month uh, with 23 um, beds in, in, in this department. So, so all of this we are, we are spending now to ensure that we improve the, the services at accident and emergency to the public of St. Lucia and to visitors who access our, our hospitals. So um, I cannot give you a specific amount, but I can tell you that the health and security, the amounts in the budget, the health and security levy, clearly um, this levy is assisting, but nowhere close to what we need to spend. Let me just give an example. The, we, the, the hospital, we are probably spending about 18 to 20 million dollars in subvention to the St. Jude Hospital. And this hospital requires 40 to 45 million dollars um, to operate. Um, we're spending possibly 55 to 60 million dollars um, at the Millennium Heights Medical Complex. This hospital requires about 80 million dollars um, and counting to operate. What we are trying to do is to work with the, the hospitals and to see how best incrementally we can increase the subventions. We have increased the subventions to both Millennium Heights Medical Complex and the St. Jude Hospital over 2021-2022. And we are, hopefully we are going to continue to increase the subventions. It's very important for us to ensure that we have efficiency. And so therefore the systems at the hospitals, and that is why we had the special meeting in the cabinet with, both management, with the management of both hospitals to ensure that we get it right. The efficiencies at the hospitals, the processes, how can we change the processes if we need more staff at accident and emergency? How can we do it efficiently so that we give St. Lucians and whoever visits the hospital a better service? But we do recognize that we need to spend more money, but we need to spend the money in the right way to ensure that people get, our people and people who visit the hospitals get better services. Um, having said all cabinet. that, how does cabinet, yes, how does the government um, actually yeah. um, plan to fund health in the long term? Okay, very good. Well, this is a question which 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 comes all the time. Very, very important, and we have taken this the answer to this question very seriously. The funding of of healthcare in in the long run is 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 something that is is critical. We speak of universal health coverage, and we know that while many services in St. Lucia are provided at, be at below true cost, and many of the services, some of them are provided at no cost over the years, and since our government came in, there are some of the services we have, we have in increased the number of services that have been provided at no cost. And so there must be a sustainable method 
to finance healthcare in St. Lucia. And so here is what we have been doing. We have been analyzing the work which, which has been done or the work which was done by professionals before we came into government. The work which was done by a number of individuals, Dr. King and several others, the World Bank and several others for many, many years. And we have taken all of that information and we are applying to that information new thinking and, and the new realities. And we are, we've been asking those professionals to give us a clear idea of the best way to finance, to sustainably finance the universal health coverage, which we are already implementing through budgetary allocations to sustainably finance it so that we have our pharmaceuticals and also to in include the private sector in health, the, the doctors and, and the private hospital and so on, to include them in it. So the model for, for financing universal health coverage and also the rest of the health sector, we are going to present to St. Lucia very soon. We are working on it and we are at the stage where we we believe we can present one or two models to St. Lucians and for the cabinet to, to make a decision on how to go. But definitely, while at this stage we are financing universal health coverage out of budgetary allocations, there is a need, and we do recognize we are working on it, there's a need to have a sustainable model which we are going to take um, to the Parliament of St. Lucia. There's a need to have a separate and unique um, law, in, a, in other words, legislation, which will cause us to, to finance and provide health care um, in a sustainable way to the population of St. Lucia. So there are two aspects. The primary aspect, how do we finance primary care at the wellness centers um, to cause more St. Lucians to, to go to the wellness centers for, for basic care and for, for, for you know, continuous care and, and advice, and also the secondary care which is where we have a lot of our costs, the hospitals. How do we finance our hospitals so that we have sustainable, high quality care at the hospitals? So both of these are being looked at and I can, I can assure you that the government, the Ministry of Finance and also the, the Ministry of Health, um, assistance from, from the World Bank and also local professionals, we have been working over the last two and a half years to come up with, with the options of modeling. Our team has visited other countries, um, the, both the Ministry of Finance and the, 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 the Ministry of Health. We've had several study tours as far as South Korea, um, Washington, you know, Colombia. We are looking at the French system, Martinique and Guadeloupe and so on. And how can we sustainable, sustainably sorry, finance healthcare? One last thing I want to say, in all of this sustainable financing of healthcare, we cannot do it on our own. And we must continue to strengthen the partnerships that we have with our French neighbors, Martinique and Guadeloupe, and also our other Caribbean neighbors, Trinidad and Tobago, and, and the, wider, the wider Caribbean. Because there are certain services. We must have certain services that, 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 must be out, that will be outsourced because of the, the cost of it and, and because of certain other issues. But we are trying our very best to introduce the services that we can introduce now. Maternal childcare, and in a few days we are going to launch um, HPV, cervical cancer, and, and prostate cancer um, diagnosis to, to increase the diagnosis, the diagnostic pos um, possibilities, and to not just increase diagnostic possibilities, but to create a path for those individuals, um, a path for and of treatment. So that it's not just the diagnosis, but what is the path for treatment? Um, if some of it, you know, some of it can be done here, what is the path? What is the cost? And, and so on. So I, I, I continue to just thank the, the medical professionals in St. Lucia, the staff of the ministry, and also the staff of the various hospitals, the nurses, the doctors, the ancillary staff, the, you know, the, those who work at, in the kitchen, the security, everybody, St. Jude, OKEU, and all of the private medical professionals and their businesses for doing their, their very best to um, provide quality healthcare in St. Lucia. It is challenging, but we believe it is one, if we continue to, if we continue to work the way we should and, and put resources, we will get a much better health system in, in time to come. We continue to work on quality, and we continue to work on providing assistance to the hospitals and the primary care facilities in particular. So national health insurance health industry regarding providing a sustainable model for financing our health sector? 
Well, na national health insurance is just one model. There are several models, and in the in different countries, there are several models. Nat national health insurance is just one model. It is not a, a panacea. I mean, we have so many examples of countries when, where they have national health insurance, and uh, you know they have to, to, to review and break down and change and so on. It's really challenging. Our, our, you know, our, uh, the best bet is a long-term bet. And that is to reduce the incidence of non-communicable diseases. And that is to reduce the incidence of non-communicable diseases among the population. So every single one of us, every family, every school, every church must focus on that. How do we cause our own people, ourselves, to, to do some of the basic things that are maybe very difficult for us to do? Changing lifestyle, walk a little more, you know, drink some more water, um, meditate some more for to help with the mental health, um, you know, laugh a little more. It might sound simple, but some of these things, and I, I, I don't want to make it sound that it's so simple, but the, the medical professionals are saying to us that, um, yes, we will build bigger hospitals and have import more medications and so on, but the real answer is, is at the micro level, at the family level, at the school level, at the community level. Um, are we having more walks? Are we you know, mental health, are we doing more community things, are we eating more fruits and vegetables, are we going to our doctors more regularly? And that, over the long term, is going to even help the pressure at the accident and emergency departments. Because the doctors are saying to us, 19 to 20 something percent of the cases they get at accident and emergency is really issues relating to non-communicable diseases that can be dealt with at a different level. So we have a very big issue, not only in St. Lucia, but in the Caribbean. And the government will do its best with promotion and with assistance and so on. But we have an even bigger role to play, bigger job with community organizations, community groups, and so on, to cause that NCD, um, the incidence of NCDs to go down. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me run to cabinet. Good afternoon this time, yes. <laughs> So as you know, this government has been in governance for about three years. Well, on Friday, it will be three years. And during this time, the government has actioned several policies in education aimed at improving the socioeconomic situation of our citizens. And in the St. Lucian context, barriers to finance when it comes to education is a very real problem and most of these initiatives or policies rather are geared at improving this are geared at fixing this problem where we have bright citizens but they can't afford to attain tertiary education the first initiative i want to inform you about is the unipass um, which is actioned via the ministry of education this is for individuals who encounter difficulty facilitating their degree while in university, or for individuals who got accepted into university and need assistance. The UniPass assists with accommodation, airfare, transport, visa processing, tuition, and one can stand to get assistance with up to $10,000. This is the maximum. So I'm sure we know of many individuals who reach university and encounter difficulties and they either have to drop out or do whatever it takes to finish university. The UniPass is aimed at helping with that problem. And individuals who want to access that facility can contact the Department of Education for more information. The second one is an initiative that the Prime Minister has spoken about extensively and in different forums. This one is the first generation Monroe College scholarships where individuals who are from a family that has never graduated university can apply. Up to 50 candidates per year 
are accepted. And for this one, you can contact the Ministry of Education, HRD, um, Monroe College, and the HRD Department of the Ministry of Education is responsible for vetting applications and for background checks, etc. So I would encourage people, especially in this season where it, it's time to, people are getting ready to go to university, to look into, well, maybe not this one, I'm not sure when you need to apply, but in future, this is a policy, this is a scholarship that it is aimed at helping, empowering households to get themselves educated. Because when you help one individual, you are not just empowering that individual, you are empowering a household, generations. And the most recent one is the Education Loan Financing Facility, which can be accessed um, via St. Lucia Development Bank. The launch was last week. And uh, it is aimed at individuals who are high performing, but do not, they cannot afford to go to university. So um, for this loan, no collateral is necessary for the students who qualify. It is for students who cannot qualify for the regular loan financing facilities in other banks. With this loan, government will guarantee. Government, government will guarantee the loan for you for this one. Um, no payments while at school. Um, I think I'm not sure, but I don't want to say anything that's not accurate. So for more information, SLDB, contact St. Lucia Development Bank. Also, during the three years of governance, the one laptop per child policy is back on track. It has been re reinstated, and it ensures that every secondary school student is supplied with a laptop to further their education and to be in the know. Since coming into office in July 2021, the government has commissioned 20 smart classrooms in St. Lucia through the Caribbean Digital. Uh, since coming into office in July 2021, the government has commissioned 20 smart classrooms in St. Lucia through the Caribbean Digitization Transformation Project. That's another initiative aimed at keeping our students in the know and learning in the modern era. Last year, last academic year, the teachers of St. Lucia, so an increase in their material, teacher material allowance, it increased from $800 to $1,400. This is a one-time allowance given every September, I believe, to teachers to facilitate the upgrade of the classrooms, etc. And still to come, 93 registered early childhood schools in St. Lucia will receive a lump sum grant of $2,500 from the government to assist with purchasing school supplies for the 2024-2025 academic year, which means that this is going to happen very soon. And the government will invest $22.5 million to restore and rehabilitate 16 school plants. And this will ensure safe and secure and comfortable spaces for students to thrive and learn. Another very important development, four secondary schools will be transformed into technical and vocational education and training, or TVET, institutions. The Stanley John Audlum Secondary School will serve as an institute of arts, media, and design. The Grand Rivier Secondary School will be converted into an institute of sustainable agriculture, culinary, and entrepreneurial services. The Urge Secondary School will be the institute for engineering and technology, and the PI Secondary School will serve as the institute of construction and heritage. And those TVET institutions will ensure that students have a diverse opportunities to pursue their passions and prepare for various career paths in a rapidly evolving world so no one gets left behind. Okay. 
anything, does it? Um, I just want to go back to the UNICAS um, initiative. Um, you said What's that? The UNICAS? UNIPAS. It? UNIPAS. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, UNIPAS. Because um, you spoke about um, those who face, who may face difficulties in the, you know, in refinancing as they actually, well, that, that's people who would have um, started. People would have started, people got accepted, but they have difficulty. For example, you got accepted, but you need a visa to get there. Unipass could help you with monies to for the ticket, for the visa fee. Okay, so then the students from Spartan University who are now left, well, figuring out what next, or what they're going to do since um, the university they were studying at, Spartan University lost its accreditation. Mm -hmm. um, the students now have to find other, well, schools to finish their studies. Some of them are not able to actually continue, but have to start over, which means that is an additional financial burden for them. So we have students, some have gotten accepted, some have been, are going to start in September, but there are many others, mainly from the Viewfort um, area, who they don't know what to do. They don't have the monies, according to them, and they would have spent for this semester and that money is not going to be refunded by the school, and so mm -hmm. they lost the entire year, and, and obviously years of studies. Um, can they apply for UNICAS? Like UNIPAS? Okay, so I feel for those so. students, because I know how expensive education can be, and I see how you're trying to tie the two. However, um, this is a question for possibly the education authorities. But thank you for your question. Any more questions? Okay, thank you.